Physics on a branch knotted space-time manifold is a theory that unifies quantum mechanics with gravity and the other forces. In this theory, we assume that the space-time manifold is branched and embedded in a higher dimensional space, and because of that embedding, the manifold can be knotted, and we'll show how those knots correspond to the elementary particles. In this presentation, we're going to begin by describing the universe as it appears in this theory. We will start at an astronomical scale, and then look at smaller and smaller scales, all the way down to the quantum level. Then we will describe the assumptions that generate this theory, and show how the logical conclusions of those assumptions match the description that we've just provided. In this theory, we're trying to address a long-standing problem. When we combine the assumptions of general relativity with the assumptions of quantum mechanics, we find that point-like particles produce unfortunate infinities. In M theory, or string theory, we can modify the assumptions by no longer assuming point-like particles, but we find that the diverse number of ways of making a string theory can produce so many different theories that it is unclear which assumptions are the correct ones, and as a consequence, predictions are difficult. In this theory, we assume that particles are knots in space-time, and therefore they're never point-like. Furthermore, because of the simple assumptions of this theory, we find that prediction is possible. We assume that the space-time manifold can be knotted, and in order to tie a knot in the manifold, the manifold must be embedded in a higher dimensional space. If we begin with the assumption that the space-time manifold has three plus one dimensions, then those three spatial dimensions need to be embedded in something with five spatial dimensions in order for the manifold to be knotted. We therefore assume that the space-time manifold M is embedded in a Minkowski 5 plus 1 space that we call omega. The metric on omega is the familiar eta mu nu, and there's also an inherited metric on m, which we call eta bar mu nu. And the only distinction between those is that eta bar mu nu is only defined on the manifold m, but for any curve that is on m, the length measured by eta bar mu nu would be the same as the length measured by eta mu nu. In this diagram, we see a two-manifold embedded in a three-space. And we'll continue to use this lower dimensional example in the diagrams that follow. We note that the manifold in this diagram appears to be flat, but it doesn't have to be. We begin at an astronomical scale, the scale at which general relativity is most successful. And we look at the manifold as if we are observers in the Minkowski space omega. And in the diagram, we portray a massive object. That massive object affects the curvature of M by changing the shape of M as an embedding in omega. We can see how the mass changes the shape of M by taking a slice through the manifold. Then we look at that slice in the dimensions x1 and x3. We see that the manifold is not flat, but rather it has waves extending up in the direction x3. And if we're looking at a three-dimensional manifold, embedded in a five-dimensional space, we would see those waves extending into the dimensions x4 and x5. The manifold M also changes in time, which is to say that it is moving in the Minkowski space. In the diagram on the right, those waves would be oscillating up and down in the direction x3. And for a three-manifold embedded in a five space, the waves into x4 and x5 would be rotating in the coordinates x4 and x5. If we had a clock near the massive object, for example, at the black point that is indicated in the diagram, then looking at the diagram on the right, we would see that that point would be moving in the Minkowski space. Because it's moving in the Minkowski space, we know that it will experience time dilation. The magnitude of the time dilation is determined by the magnitude of its velocity in the Minkowski space, which is determined by the amplitude of the wave and that wave amplitude increases as you get closer to a massive object. We see then how we can reproduce the geometric effects of general relativity using an embedded manifold. Getting closer to the masses, we see that they consist of individual particles, like protons and electrons. Getting closer to an individual particle, we see that it has a quantum probability distribution that describes its location. And then getting still closer, we see that at this very small scale, we can discern that the manifold is branched. 
The way in which the manifold is branched is indicated by the slices that we take through this manifold. For example, in the lower right, we see what the slice would look like if the manifold were unbranched with a single line. We see what the slice would look like if the manifold branched once. And below that, we see what the slice through the manifold would look like if the manifold were branched many times. In the top diagram, we take two slices through the manifold. In the top slice, we look at a slice where the quantum probability of finding a particle is zero. There are no instances of the particle on any of the branches. In the bottom slice, we see a slice where the quantum probability of finding the particle is non-zero, and there are many instances of the particle on the branches of the manifold. Looking more closely, we see that those individual instances of the particle are in fact knots in each of the branches of the manifold. Getting closer to one of the branches, we can look at an individual knot. Here we use a circle to depict a knot, but we note that the circle is not an accurate representation of the geometry of the knot. Remember that the manifold has three space-like dimensions, and it's embedded in Minkowski space with five space-like dimensions. And the geometry of the knot can change, either by increasing the magnitude to which it extends out from the manifold, or by changing the angle of its orientation. Because the Minkowski space has two more space-like dimensions than the space-time manifold, that magnitude and orientation can be encoded with a two-dimensional vector or a single complex number. The branches of the manifold are continually splitting and recombining. And as they split and recombine, their interaction results in interaction of the knots on the branches. The knot geometries are likewise affected by those interactions. And we can describe the effect on the knot geometry by describing the effect on the complex number that describes that knot's magnitude and orientation. The probability of observing the particle at any particular location depends on the density of the knots at that location, but also depends on the geometry of the knots at that location. In particular, as the knot magnitude increases, the probability of observing the particle at that location also increases. The knots move on their branches independently of each other, in a behavior similar to diffusion. And when the knots interact with each other, their geometries are affected in a way similar to interference. The discrete interacting branches of the manifold and the knots on the manifold are a complex system, but we can simplify the discrete branches by taking a continuous limit. And the continuous limit of the knot interactions produces a path integral that has the same form as quantum mechanics. This takes us down to the smallest scale that we'll consider in this informal description. And now we'll address the assumptions that generate this theory. We assume that M, the space-time manifold, is a branched 3 plus 1 manifold it's embedded in a Minkowski 5 plus 1 space. We assume a vector field A nu that is defined on M and a scalar field rho that is also defined on M. And we use them to build a metric. G mu nu is equal to rho squared A alpha comma mu A alpha comma nu. Then we constrain the metric G relative to the metric eta, where we remember that eta is the metric of the Minkowski space. We also require that the metric G mu nu is Ricci flat which we write r hat mu nu is equal to zero. We define a branch weight, w, equal to the square root absolute value determinant of g. And we say that it's preserved at branching, and w must be greater than or equal to one everywhere. We haven't provided enough context to fully understand or evaluate the assumptions that are presented here. But we show these assumptions because these assumptions, as listed, are the entirety of the theory. Every physical consequence of this theory results from these assumptions. For example, our assumptions allow the manifold to spontaneously produce pairs of knots that have the topology R3 pound S1 cross P2. And these knots are the elementary fermions of the theory. Different embeddings of these knots give different generations of the elementary fermions. The space-time manifold is constrained but it is under constrained. Therefore, it maximizes entropy. In the diagram on the left, 
we see an example of a high entropy case. In the diagram on the right, we see an example of a low entropy case. We can use a Lagrangian L to estimate the entropy of M, such that at every point on M, the Lagrangian L estimates the entropy at that point. And the total entropy is just the integral of the Lagrangian over the manifold. And maximizing the entropy of the branch manifold is equivalent to maximizing the action of that Lagrangian. Using our assumptions, we can derive a Lagrangian that estimates the entropy of the space-time manifold. We use r, the scalar curvature, relative to eta bar mu nu, where the scalar curvature only considers the shape of the manifold as an embedding within the Minkowski space. We can define a tensor f mu nu equal to a nu comma mu minus a mu comma nu, where we recall that we introduce the vector field a nu in order to define the metric g mu nu. Then we find that the entropy of the manifold depends both on r and f mu nu, and the Lagrangian that estimates that entropy is L equals w times 1 half f mu nu f mu nu minus r. We see that there is a term for electromagnetism of the form f mu nu f mu nu, and a term for gravity of the form scalar curvature r. The knots r3 pound s1 cross p2 can link to each other, and if they are linked to each other, we see that there are quarks. They cannot be separated from each other, and that topological effect is the strong force. The electroweak unification results from knot geometry because the knot geometry bulges up out of the manifold in a way that is not parallel to flat spacetime. And the dynamical behavior of fields on that geometry is distinct from the behavior of fields on flat spacetime. And taking into account the knot geometry, we can describe the behavior of the fields in a way that is consistent with electroweak unification. An electron is an elementary fermion and it has the topology R3 pound S1 cross P2. We can use Lagrangian to find a relationship between the electron's charge and its spin angular momentum. Remembering that the spin angular momentum has magnitude h bar over 2, this gives us a comparison between the electron charge and Planck's constant. We can therefore derive the fine structure constant. We arrive at an estimate of alpha inverse, it's approximately 136.85, which has an error of about 0.1% in comparison to the actual value of 137.04. We emphasize that in this calculation, there was no fine tuning. No parameters were altered to produce this result. It is likely that including more Feynman diagrams would improve the accuracy of the calculation. Also, we note that the Lagrangian that we derived is only a leading order approximation which allows us to drive this estimate in the weak field case. But including additional terms into the Lagrangian would also show how the coupling constant runs as a function of field energy. Altogether, we have the following. M is a branched 3 plus 1 manifold that's embedded in a Minkowski 5 plus 1 space. We produce a metric g mu nu equal to rho squared a alpha comma mu a alpha comma nu, and that metric is constrained. The manifold can spontaneously produce knots of the form R3 pound S1 cross P2. Interaction of the branches of the branch manifold produces quantum interference, and maximization of the entropy of the manifold produces fields and forces. For more information, please consult the site notphysics.net, which contains the following papers and addresses all the topics shown here as well as many other topics to considerably greater detail.